hope you can see me yes okay uh, good afternoon friends uh, i am happy to see your interest in this topic therapeutic drug monitoring of antibiotics we have started therapeutic drug monitoring long time back uh, but uh, in the area of antimicrobials, we are not using it frequently in its fullest potential. Uh, and there are reasons for that. One is practical issue. Um, so we have to evolve a lot from here. And I will be discussing about how our progress will be in the near future so that TDM of antimicrobials will be more practical. And also I'll be discussing of, about the importance of TDM uh, in the area of antimicrobials. Thank you for your interest. I hope you will enjoy it. And I, I don't bore you to death. Okay. So, so why uh, TDM? people have uh, found a relationship between the pharmacology effects of a drug and the accessible concentration of a drug. So accessible concentration is important. So even if the uh, infection is in the heart, uh, we should not be going to the heart to take a sample and um, check whether there is adequate concentrations. So whether accessible concentration here it's mostly it is blood or sometimes it is csf sometimes it is pleural fluid sometimes it is saliva uh, or epithelial lining fluid so whether accessible concentration of a drug does it have an implication on the clinical outcome so yes people have found that yes it has okay so Previously, normally, how we do antibiotic uh, um, treatment, we ad uh, administer the drug. If you do not find a response based on the culture reports, we administer the antibiotic. And if we do not see a response, we may switch to another antibiotic and we wait for the response to happen, right? So, or we adjust the dose because the response is not happening in the phase with that we require. We adjust the dose, try. Or sometimes the worst case scenario is we may change the antimicrobial. Here, when we do the TDM, there is a, one more component coming in. So we give the drug, we see the concentration of antibiotic in the blood, and objectively adjust the dose to have a therapeutic response. Okay, so this is more objective. Okay. So what are the different factors that affect treatment outcome when we do the antibiotic treatment? One is site of infection. If the infection is deep seated, it is more difficult to treat that. So site of infection, then virulence of pathogen, obviously. Then adequate control of source of infection. So if the source of infection is not adequately controlled, for example, if there is a pus, you have to drain it. Pyema, you have to drain it, right? So. Um, then pharmacologic properties of antimicrobial agents. Some of the antibiotics have very high protein binding. Some of them have very high volume of distribution. So you have to choose the antibiotic accordingly for the site of infection. So the pharmacological properties of antimicrobial agents plays a very important role. For example, polymyxins, you do not give for lung infections. You, you know that it will not penetrate the lung tissue. You have to give in a different route of administration if you are going to treat with polymyxins, right? So pharmacological properties of antimicrobial agent is important. Choice and dosing of antimicrobial agents. So choice, yes, culture reports. And dosing, how you dose the antibiotics. And patient characteristics like critically ill patient or if the patient have significant comorbidities, extremes of body weight, extremes of age. This can all affect the treatment outcome. Here, what are the factors which are in the control of a clinician of a doctor is two things. One is adequate control of source of infection. And second thing is 
choice and dosing of antimicrobial agents. So these two factors are completely under our control. Okay, but the other things are not in our control. So at least these things, if we do it properly, we expect a better clinical outcome. And the antimicrobial pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, they govern the design of an optimal antimicrobial regimen. How the regimen should be? It is ideally decided by the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics means it involves the patient and the drug. Pharmacodynamics, it involves the patient receptors and also the, the organism which you are trying to kill. Okay, so these two factors in uh, basically decide how you should design an optimal antimicrobial regimen. Because we see a lot of inter-individual variation in dose-response relationship. Dose and response. There is something in between concentration. Between the dose and response, there is a concentration. So concentration, so dose will achieve some concentration in a particular patient and concentration will have a response. So if you, uh, so if you look at only at the dose and response, you will see a lot of variation in the dose and response. Okay, so you have to optimize treatment for people, ideally. Why? Because a lot of parameters affect the antibiotic exposure. For example, the patient factors like age, sex, body mass index, renal conditions, disease conditions, genetic polymorphisms, etc., And the drug characteristics like volume of distribution is clearance, bioavailability, it's protein binding, concomitant drug administration, okay? All these affect the exposure uh, of a drug in a certain patient. So we have to optimize the dose regimen. As an example, um, friends, you are uh, free to ask questions in between, okay? You don't have to wait for me to finish the entire lecture. So either you note it down and ask me that later, or you can directly ask in between. I hope I will be able to answer some of them. Yeah. So um, are you clear? I'm, I'm audible to you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So as an example for the variability of antibiotic exposure, here I'm bringing the example of cholesterol. Cholesterol uh, I bring because uh, this is one of the antibiotics which I am doing the study on. So uh, we are doing a study with uh, intensive care unit, surgical ICU uh, and endocrine department. Um, here we have recruited 61 patients of, on cholesterol, patients who are on cholesterol and neuropenem. So patients who are on cholesterol, 61 patients we have recruited. We have seen their exposure over a period of time. So over a period of 350 hours, that's, I mean, oh, from the start of antibiotic therapy, uh, some patients, we have checked their level of antibiotic on the seventh day. Some patients, I have checked the antibiotic level on the first day, some of them on the fifth day, like that. So not one patient followed up for 350 hours, not like that. So patients are given different uh, doses as prescribed by the doctors who are treating the patients, which are like suggested doses for treatment, okay, based on their GFR, based on their body weight, et cetera, et cetera. And I have checked the AUC, that means the exposure over at the interdose interval, eight hours or if within 12 hours, I have checked the exposure of cholesterol. You can see, ideally, uh, you have seen the red mark here, the horizontal line, right? Um, let me get it. Sorry about this. You have seen the horizontal line. So this is the average concentration you are targeting it. it should, you should target that concentration. That is the ideal concentration to achieve. But you see, many of them have very low exposures. Some of them have very high exposures and exposures more than three is supposed to be toxic. Okay. You see, uh, it's everywhere. So uh, if you dose a patient based on the recommended doses, this is a situation that you will come across. And obviously, there is a high chance for treatment failure. Okay. But if you decide on for cholesterol, if you decide to dose based on GFR, um, 
you won't be able to see there's no good quality so this is uh, from our data okay um you you are not able to see a good correlation between gfr and the exposure okay this i will explain what is cholesterol steady state average i will explain that just imagine that this exposure to cholesterol it is not so well correlated with gfr it r square is only 0.11 please hold on i will come back in a minute all right okay so even if you consider gfrs many a times in many number of cases you may dose the patient either high or low okay so it's again not very reliable gfr based dosing for cholesterol um and people have suggested based on the in vitro study uh, on murine thigh infection model the advantage of uh, in vitro in vivo sorry uh, this is in vivo study in murine model okay thigh infection model uh, the advantage of these models and in vitro studies are they are relatively pure studies the patient factors do not come in uh, like patient's general condition or patient's comorbid conditions or uh, blood supply or you know, i mean poor medications uh okay all these conditions will not or the immune stat status of the patient none of these factors inf influence the outcome so that is the advantage of in vitro models and the x y y models okay so here uh, the murine thigh infection model they have suggested an exposure to cholesterol of 2 to 2.5 average one particular exposure one particular target of cholesterol i will tell you how we find that okay so 2 to 2.5 mg per liter uh to reach an exposure as auc by mic of 50 to 60 okay so the concentrations of antibiotic over a period of cholestin over a period of 24 hours uh divided by mic it should be somewhere between 50 to 60 and uh, we have checked the uh, acute kidney injury in these patients uh, 22 patients we have recruited and uh, we've seen that 32 percent of patients had acute kidney injury okay or oh, by day seven of treatment and uh, in those patients who did not develop acute kidney injury the average concentration is 2.7 and in those who developed acute kidney injury the average concentrations are much higher more than double right? i mean roughly double right and it's highly significant in 22 patients. So is there any evidence other than our hospital? Yes, cholesterol use is associated with nephrotoxicity and it is proven in meta-analysis in random of randomized controlled trials. So it is proven in 3,377 patients. The nephrotoxicity incidence in patients who received cholesterol was 36.2. It is roughly similar to what we got. The nephrotoxicity rate was significantly higher in cholesterol AM than comparators and the number needed to harm was five okay and in another study this study uh they have seen that acute kidney injury was almost apparent within the first 72 hours of treatment so if the cholesterol is the reason for acute kidney injury it should happen mostly within the first 72 hours of treatment initiation with cholesterol so this is well established Cholestin can cause nephrotoxicity and it's around 30% uh, if you do not do TDM. Then, um, and um, yeah, so based on the pharmacokinetic study, studies, um, to get an AUC of 50 to 60 milligram hour per liter, we have to aim a target average, steady state average of 2 to 2.5. I'll explain how to calculate all this for efficacy. So what are the practical issues with TDM? One is there is a delay in achieving steady state, especially for antibiotics, which have long half-life. And uh, you cannot wait for steady state to achieve in many of the cases, okay? The earliest the treatment, adequate concentration achieved earliest, the best. And monitoring, normally TDM is recommended only once the steady state is achieved 
except in conditions such as renal failure. Because in renal failure, if you want to achieve steady state, some in some cases it goes to many days or even months. So you do not recommend to wait for renal failure, sorry, steady state in patients with renal failure. So if a patient has renal failure, for example, vancomycin, uh, GFR of the patient is 30. Uh, Leonie, can you close the door? Okay, so if the patient, uh, if you need to see the concentration of vancomycin, you don't have to wait for five times half-life of vancomycin in the renal failure patients. Okay, you can, uh, within, ideally speaking, within three days, you should check any antibiotic, whatever the antibiotic is, within three days, you should see the exposure, irrespective of their steady state conditions. Okay, um, now, if you are giving an antibiotic, so this is the situation. The first dose when you give, concentrations increase over a period of time when you give the infusion, and then once the infusion is over, it pours, okay? Over a period of time. So this is concentration in y-axis and time in x-axis. Second dose goes up, comes down. But you can see that there is an increase in exposure here. By the time here, there is more antibiotic from here to here, right? And, uh, and the third dose, it again goes up. So there is some amount of accumulation happening in the initial few days or hours. And to cross an MIC, it may take time for the antibiotic. To cross the MIC, it may take the time for the antibiotic, okay? So we will uh, expand this, this part. So, with, uh, one question. Yes, so, is this with uh, loading dose or with just uh, three million units? So, sorry, this is not with loading dose. It is not. I mean, if you give antibiotic without loading dose, this is the normal scenario, and especially for those antibiotics which have long half life. For meropenem, it really doesn't matter because the half life of meropenem is only one hour, uh, and but for cholestin or Ticoplanin or TG cycling, um, it matters. Polymixin, it matters. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so uh, it takes time for the actual antibiotic concentrations to cross the MIC to kill the organism. So it's highly recommended to use loading dose for antibiotics, especially for those which have a long half life. So according to the surviving sepsis campaign guideline, they recommend administration of effective antimicrobials within the first hour of recognition of septic shock and severe sepsis without septic shock. So within the first hour of recognition of septic shock, we are supposed to uh, dose one minute. Eh? Yes, and various simulation studies. Simulation studies are done in computer based on the ex, uh, ex, uh, all the uh, experience that we have till now. Simulation studies show that this target will not be reached at first dose for majority of critical ill patients if using the most commonly recommended doses. Okay, and uh, there's something called Bayesian PKPD models. They help to achieve the target antibiotic concentration in the shortest time possible in patients. So I will explain what the basin PKPD models are. So before explaining all that, these are the pharmacokinetic parameters that we look at. Trough, in, for some antibiotics, some anti-infectives, we look at trough. For some of them, we look at Cmax. For some of them, we look at the AUC area under the curve. I will explain all these parameters. Then there is something called area under inhibitory curve. Then T more than MIC. I will explain what that is. C max above MIC and steady state average concentration. Okay, so I'll explain all this. So a dose is given, two doses are given. So here, what is the drug? The lowest concentration of drug, which is before 
the next dose. So lowest concentration of antibiotic happens before the following dose, right? And uh, that is called trough. And normally we say trough should be collected within one hour before the scheduled dose. Okay, trough, should, trough sample should be collected within one hour before the scheduled dose. But if you are suspecting toxicity for a drug, for an antibiotic, for example, polystyrene, you don't have to actually do a trough. Sometimes uh, you may send a trough sample after two days of polystyrene. So the patient is not recovering, even though when you stop polystyrene, the patient is not recovering. So it's not trough, it's random concentration. Uh, so still, uh, you can send a sample here because we are uh, looking why toxicity, whether it's a drug related toxicity. So to rule out that, you don't have to send a trough sample. Okay, so this is trough. Trough means just one hour, within one hour before the scheduled dose. Then this is called Cmax. Cmax is, it's not at the end of infusion. So normally we say uh, at the end of infusion, concentration in the blood will be the maximum. But when we say Cmax, we do not normally refer it to as the end of infusion. It is roughly half an hour after the infusion is over. Okay, so if you are giving uh, amikacin over a period of um, 15 minutes, if you are giving amikacin like over a period of 15 minutes, then uh, Cmax sample is collected half an hour after the end of infusion. So that means 45 minutes after the start of infusion, you have to take the sample and that is a Cmax. Okay, uh, so that is Cmax, that is maximum concentration. And this is the AUC, that means the area under the, this particular is AUC is, sorry, this is uh, partly wrong because AUC starts from here, from here down, because concentration is from zero to upright. So AUC from here, so it's like this, okay? Everything, everything under this red curve is AUC, this exposure. Okay, this is AUC exposure over a period of time. Okay, and this is AUIC. So what is AUIC is area under inhibitory curve, which is, uh, so suppose the antibiotic MIC is here and the area under the curve above the MIC, this is area under inhibitory curve. I'm just explaining these parameters, okay? And then, T above MIC, so what is that? So you have another parameter, okay? So this is the inter-dose interval. So within two doses, between the two doses, okay? This is one inter-dose interval, okay? And this is a time of inter-dose interval. That will be in some hours. Maybe sometimes it is eight hours if you're giving antibiotic every eight hourly. If you're giving antibiotic every 12 hourly, it is it will be 12. Okay, that is the time of interdose interval. And this is the time during which the antibiotic concentration is above the MIC. Time for which antibiotic concentration is above the MIC. That is represented as small t. Okay, so what is t more than MIC? It is the small t divided by the time of interdose interval into 100. So that is the percentage of time the antibiotic concentrations are above the MIC. Is it clear, friends? So that is yes, the T, uh, so that is T above MIC, okay? And now what is steady state average? Another term, steady state average is, if the steady state AUC, that means you have to wait till the steady state of antibiotic happens. For, for, uh, for vancomycin, it is after third dose. By fourth dose, it will be steady state or in normal renal condition, okay? Um, so you have to wait for the steady state and you find the AUC at steady state and you have to divide the time during which the AUC is estimated. For example, if vancomycin is given every 12 hourly, on third day, you have seen the AUC and you have to see the uh, so AUC value divided by 12 that will give you steady state average so here is a calculation here so for example if the a a AUC is 19 okay suppose AUC is 19 and uh, the time interval is 72 and 80 the subtraction subtract that is eight eight hours right eight hours so 19 divided by eight that will give you steady state average okay 
So basically, it is the average concentration over a period of time. Um, and you have to also learn the, know the terms concentration dependent and time dependent killing. I hope you all know the difference between concentration dependent and time dependent killing. So for those antibiotics which are concentration dependent, the, they, the goal is to maximize the concentration by administering the total daily dose less frequently. If you are giving uh, 1,500 milligram, you have to divide, give 1,500 milligram like that. Don't divide it as 500, 500, 500. So you, your goal is to maximize the Cmax, okay? For time-dependent antibiotic, your goal is to maximize the T more than MIC. The percentage of time the antibiotic concentrations are above the MIC, okay? So these are the antibiotic examples which follow these. And certain drugs have post-antibiotic effect. For example, aminoglycosin, most of the protein synthesis inhibiting antibiotics have post-antibiotic effect, okay? Especially uh, like aminoglycosides. Aminoglycoside has a concentration dependent killing and a post-antibiotic effect. So the advantage is these conditions like amikacin, you can dose once daily because there is a good post-antibiotic effect so even if the antibiotic concentrations fall below, much below the MIC for a long period of time, the uh, bacteria will not be able to reproduce, multiply. So these are the ideal antibiotics. So concentration dependent antibiotics with post antibiotic effect, you can actually dose once daily. Okay. So uh, what are the factors, targets that we talk? One is Cmax by MIC. So for aminoglycoside, we use the term Cmax by MIC. That is a target that we use, target term that we use when we use aminoglycoside, Cmax by MIC. For example, for amikacin, it should be eight to 12 times above MIC. Cmax should be eight to 12 times above the MIC of the antibiotic, MIC of the organism. And time dependent killing, you look at the T above MIC. For drugs, which work based on total exposure, you look at the ID under the curve, okay, AUC by MIC. So it's not pure concentration dependent killing. This uh, antibiotics which uh, follow this parameter is not completely dependent on Cmax or T above MIC. It, it is dependent on the total exposure over the period of time, okay? For example, vancomycin or cholestin. So I will briefly explain the dose adjustment guidelines. So for concentration dependent antibiotic with post antibiotic effect, how do you treat? So if you, if an antibiotic is concentration dependent and if you frequently dose, okay, you give multiple doses in a period of uh, within 24 hours, your Cmax is here and your MIC is here. You have relatively small Cmax by MIC, okay? And that is not good for concentration dependent killing. Uh, so in those cases, you have to dose as one dose, okay? Dose, it is one dose in a day. So total dose, don't divide it into two, two or three doses. You give us, us one dose. So Cmax by MIC increases and that makes antibiotic treatment more effective. For time dependent antibiotic, um, if you give 1,500 milligram IV bolus once daily, you see that most of the time, more than 50% of time, the antibiotic concentrations are below the MIC, okay, which is not good. So for time-dependent uh, antibiotics, you divide the dose. So the total uh, cost of treatment is remains the same. You have only divided the dose into three doses. And that makes the antibiotic concentrations always above the MIC for time-dependent antibiotic. Well, that, that is a better way of delivering it. In case of meropenem, meropenem is a time-dependent antibiotic. So the, uh, here, uh, the, it's not only that 100% of time, the antibiotic concentrations are above, it need to be above MIC, not only that, even the trough concentration should be five times above the MIC for meropenem. Okay, the trough concentration itself should be five times above MIC for an optimal clinical response to happen.
Okay. Now, is there any relationship between duration of infusion and trough concentration? Yes, there is a relationship. So as you increase the duration of infusion from five minutes to 30 minutes to three hours or as a continuous infusion, okay? As you increase the duration of infusion here, your frequency of antibiotic administration is same. Your uh, dose of antibiotic is same. What you're changing is only the duration of infusion. So if you increase the duration of infusion, the trough concentration, which is a semen, right? Trough concentration increases gradually. So for time dependent antibiotic, not only uh, dividing the doses in, and giving it as multiple doses will help. It also, if you give us a longer duration infusion, that also helps in ach achieving better uh, exposure to these antibiotics, time dependent killing. Okay, so if uh, antibiotic is time dependent, has a time dependent killing effect, always go for continuous infusion. That is the best. Even for vancomycin, uh, the best way of giving vancomycin or meropenem is continuous infusion, which that is that achieves the highest trough. And uh, these are some of the observations that uh, we have noticed here. Uh, please ask. Okay, till now, are you clear? Clear, sir. Uh, if anybody else has a doubt, sir, shall we just pause for one minute, sir? Yes, or, yes. If anybody has a doubt, please unmute yourself and ask, or you can also post on the chat box. Okay, I hope uh, I can continue. Yes, sir. All right, so these are some of the experiences that we have. Um, a 55-year-old diabetic diagnosed with left parasinusitis and normal renal function, okay? The functional endoscopic sinus surgery was performed on 23rd of May uh, and drain pus, CRP, uh, C-reactive protein, was 10.4 on 24th of May. It was not very high. First culture, culture has grown MRSA, but the patient did not respond to normal linear solid doses. The patient did not respond to linear solid. So the doctors have changed the antibiotic to vancomycin 1 gram PD and started on 29th May 2019. Okay. So uh, initially the CRP was 10.4 and then uh, the patient did not respond to linear solid, changed over to vancomycin 1 gram BD. Uh, on 24th of May, on 1st of June, antibiotic concentration was sent, trough is only 5.74. The Again, the doses were increased to 1.25 gram PD, but again, it's not increasing much. But when it reached 1.5 gram PD, the CRP was 62 at that point, and then it slowly started decreasing. Okay, CRP started decreasing when the antibiotic concentrations increased. So is it uh, related to antibiotic exposure? We will see. Uh, so there are studies which actually shows that uh, if the exposure, so here this is what we have measured is only trough. And trough is only a crude estimate of the actual antibiotic exposure to vancomycin. Exposure to vancomycin is, the um, trough is a crude estimate. The best way to estimate the antibiotic exposure to vancomycin is AUC, area under the curve. Because for vancomycin, area under the curve is a target that we have to look at, ideally speaking. So um, in this study, in a hollow study done in hollow fiber infection model, as I have told you before, this, uh, these in vitro models are devoid of other patient factors which can influence the outcome, such as there is no uh, comorbid conditions which can influence outcome. There is no other antibiotic which can influence outcome. Uh, the, there is the comorbid conditions like diabetes or site of infection. None of these affect the clinical outcome. So it gives a clear understanding of how the antibiotic exposure uh, kills the organism. 
So this is hollow fiber infection model. And they have come up with a uh, concentration AUC by MIC ratio of 400, more than 400, to uh, actually uh, optimize the treatment for MRSA. Okay. And in a clinical study uh, done in 2013, Pancomycin AUC by MIC ratio and 30-day uh, mortality in patients with star aureus bacteremia. In this study, AUC by MIC of more than 373 was uh, found to reduce mortality. Okay. But how to do uh, an AUC for vancomycin? It is a very uh, difficult task. It's pra not practical. Imagine uh, doing, ideally speaking, you have to see because the creat creatinine of a patient will fall on some day or it can increase on some day. So it's like uh, every day you have to wait for steady state and then do the check the uh, AUC. Okay, that is not practical. So how can we solve this issue? Okay, so um, without taking multiple samples, without daily monitoring or daily taking samples for vancomycin estimation, how can you do a TDM and to find and find the AUC? Okay. So one is get treatment history of vancomycin, get proper history. What is the treatment history? Dose, what dose was given, what time it was given. Infusion duration, all the previous history. Uh, for suppose it is the fifth day, today is the fifth day of vancomycin administration. From first day, what was the doses given? What was the time at which these doses were given? And what was the infusion duration, rough infusion duration, roughly. Then um, get the serum creatinine information, uh, gender, and uh, get a concentration, okay? One or two concentrations, okay? Uh, and concentration need not be trough. So there's a, a software called, these are, these are called Bayesian PKPD models, okay? So enter the patient details into this software, into this particular software called Bestos. Uh, and this is the future of TDM actually, hopefully in our institution also. So, um, you, you can plan the treatment. So you have entered all the patient details. Imagine all the, all the history of drug dosing is entered. Then you plan the treatment. Imagine that you're giving a thousand uh, milligram vancomycin as a one hour infusion, uh, and you uh, target an AUC like this, okay? And the serum creatinine will be like this, or if you are expecting higher serum creatinine, you can put that weight of the patient. And you can you have two two options either to optimize dose regimen or to forecast dose regimen. Forecast dose regimen means whatever you have entered in the treatment plan, it will show how the exposure will be in the future. Okay, uh, if you click optimize dose regimen, it will optimize the dose for the patient. So it will suggest the dose for you, irrespective of the doses that you have entered. If you click optimize dose regimen, the computer model will suggest the dose for you. Okay. So this is uh, the patient, one patient which we have, we are now validating this vancomycin model using this dose. Uh, hopefully it will be available soon for actual practical use. So now uh, you, you, two concentrations I have collected. See these red dots, two dots are the concentrations which I have collected. And you can see a blue shade here, and this is plain. There is no shade here, right? Past. This is past history and how the future will be. So over a period of time on March, like this, this is the uh, different dates at which different doses are given, but duration of infusion information is there, all are there, okay? And the model has fit these two concentrations, which I have measured over a period of time. It need not be tough concentrations, okay? In one interdose interval, I have measured this too. And I can actually see the entire concentration time profile for the patient in the past. So how the patient concentration was before. And you, you can also see the complete AUC, you know, you see with two uh, concentrations or two or three concentrations, you will be able to see the entire AUC over a period of time. And it will also suggest what are the doses to be given. And uh, if the fit is very good, fit means this black dots excitedly on top of these black lines. Okay, if the fit is very good, it, it will be uh, within that green circle, though, both that green circle. If the fit is really bad, it will be somewhere here or here, which means you cannot take the model uh, suggestions. If the fit is good, you can go for the model suggestions. 
So it will suggest the doses to be given, what dose to be given, how much to be given. So here they have suggested the dose, uh, best dose have suggested once daily dosing of vancomycin, like 2000 milligram, uh, like that, at what time, uh, et cetera, okay? So uh, I hope that in the future, near future, with the aid of these micro sampling techniques, so you don't have to poke the patient uh, frequently. It's like uh, you are doing the diabetes uh, glucometer checking. So with micro sampling technique, which is also coming up, I hope uh, this is a more practical way of doing TDM uh, and we can cover most people who are getting the antibiotics. So the advantage of using these basin models are steady state is not required. Sampling time, you can sample at any time, but you need to know what exact time at which you have collected the blood sample. Then AUC you can obtain with fewer time points. Now in our hospital, the basin models which are undergoing validation studies are vancomycin, colistin, and meropina. So this is another example of vancomycin. Uh, a 38 year old female administered vancomycin one gram BD for four days. Okay. On 11th, uh, vancomycin was stopped. Um, 12th, vancomycin was stopped. And 11th, we checked the uh, levels of vancomycin. It was very high. The create uh, was initially 0.85, and uh, vancomycin was stopped, but the create went up, GFR decreased. And uh, after some time, the so vancomycin is an antibiotic which is nephrotoxic in at least in some of the patients. May not be all patients, but some of the patients it is nephrotoxic. And there are multiple studies, meta analysis done, which proves that, which has proved the uh, vancomycin um, relationship with nephrotoxicity. And here also, it's not the trough that is most correlated with nephrotoxicity, it is the AUC. So uh, many times if you go by trough, there is a possibility that we may treat the patient a little bit wrongly, even though it is better than not monitoring at all. Trough is better than not monitoring the antibiotic concentration at all, definitely. But a uh, more better way of uh, doing it is with Bayesian models, see the AUC, overall exposure. Another case uh, is a 62 year old diabetic diagnosed with left renal abscess underwent simple nephrectomy. Voriconosol was started on 3rd December, 2018, okay? So Voriconosol was started as 200 milligram BD. On 10th, we checked the level of trough. It was 5.95, which is kind of okay. 5.95 is okay for, it's a decent concentration for treatment with Voriconosol. And that time his uh, CRP was 94.5, okay? Uh, but after some time, the patient had a very bad uh, uh, kidney, uh, I think kidney infection, kidney infection, uh, that, that part, that kidney was removed, nephrectomy was done, and uh, the dose of oriconosol was decreased, patient improved, the dose of oriconosol was decreased, uh, and the CRP improved, okay, CRP was improving, but at uh, same dose, the voriconosol level became very low. Okay, it started uh, falling. Even so, finally we had to give a uh, 300 milligram and 200 milligram to keep the uh, voriconosol levels high. So as the days progressed, you had to use a higher dose of voriconosol. What is the reason? Because the CRP has actually fallen. The inflammation, general inflammatory condition, has reduced for this patient, and. Uh, there is a uh, study uh, which has looked at this uh, and uh, inflammation is associated with voriconosol of concentration. So as the uh, C-reactive protein increases, the voriconosol top concentrations increases. Okay, so what is the explanation for this? In During inflammation, inflammatory conditions, your CYP uh, enzymes are uh, not very active. So voriconosol is metabolized by these CYP enzymes and therefore voriconosol levels will be high in inflammatory conditions. Uh, but when the inflammation improves, uh, the C CYP enzymes becomes more and more active and your concentrations decrease. 
So this is very important because you have to check voriconazole. Sometime later, as the patient improves slowly, you have to also repeat your voriconazole estimation. And in different conditions, what are the, so any doubts? If not, I will continue. No doubt, sir. Yes, sir. I don't think I will be able to finish by four. Um, and uh, how long? Uh, I, I uh, how much more I can extend? That's all right, sir. You go on sir, till you finish. No problem. Okay, fine. So, and pharmacokinetics of drug in various disease conditions, I'll explain. In renal failure, for a drug primarily eliminated by kidney. So, I, this is the AUC, right? This is the concentration, estim, uh, concentration over a period of time. So, black one is the concentration and the red line is the amount of drug. Black line is the concentration, red line is the amount of drug, okay? So imagine that the volume of distribution in this patient is 10 liter. In this patient, the clearance is 20, but the patient developed renal failure. So the clearance reduced to five ml per hour. Okay, from 20, it became five. So what will happen to the exposure? Both concentration and amount in the body will increase. I hope that is clear. Okay, so the exposure increases. Uh, you may have to adjust the dose. And what happens in burns? What happens in burns? Can anybody tell? What happens to the kinetics in burns? Physiologically, what happens in burns? Burns, there will be hypoalbuminemia, sir. Yes, there will be hypoalbuminemia. What happens to uh, GFR? GFR will also drop. Uh, in the initial few days, GFR will be high. There will be hyperdynamic circulation. Okay, so because of which GFR increases, increases in the initial few days, and when the patient develops sepsis, yes, then they may develop all the renal failure and associated complication. But that is sepsis. So burns per se, there is a slight increase in volume of distribution, but more than increase in volume of distribution, what is happening is there is an increase in clearance. Okay, so if initial clearance was 20, the patient's clearance will become 40 if there is burns. Okay, so if this was supposed to be the exposure, it will become like this. When the clearance increases, your total drug exposure decreases, your amount of drug in the body decreases. So you have to give higher dose for burns patient. Hope is clear. Okay, now next condition, sepsis. So what happens in sepsis? Initial phase and late phase. Sepsis is also hyperdynamic initially. Initially. So possibly the EGFR increases and eventually when there's MODS, AKI, it will come down. Yes, yes. So what is the reason for um, uh, uh, the fall in GFR during sepsis? There is a widespread capillary leak, correct? So what happens for the drugs? drug will go out of the system in circulation into the peripheral circulation correct huh? so yes, drug will go out of the system in circulation to peripheral circulation what happens to the amount of drug in the body total amount happens. of drug in the body will increase yes. but that if it's that which is in circulation the accessible concentration will be essentially be low correct so in this case should you increase the dose of antibiotic in sepsis, critically ill patient? So you, you said the systemic exposure is low, but the actual antibiotic is there. Should you increase the dose? Because when you measure the concentration, it will be low, right? Do you increase the dose? I think we should increase the dose sir, because the accessible concentration is what does the antimicrobial activity. So all the major organs, uh, are uh, the exposure is mainly led, main, mainly associated with the systemic exposure, central circulation. All the major organs are in the central circulation. So in case of sepsis, you have to, even though the amount of drug remains, it will, it will increase with the increase in volume of distribution. So initially 10, it became 60. So even though the um, volume of distribution increases, the concentration decrease, uh, amount of drug remains high, still you have to increase the dose. 
to achieve adequate concentrations in the system is circulation okay okay so in these different conditions so site of infection like uh, what are the factors affecting antibiotic concentrations at target site one is site of infection where is the infection can be sepsis generalized infection or csf uh, infection in the lungs skin and soft tissue or bone infection also it uh, uh, one is the property of antibiotic whether the antibiotic is lipophilic or a hydrophilic antibiotic small molecule antibiotic or a large molecule antibiotic and the route of administration okay, all these factors affect the uh, treatment outcome okay uh, so in case of sepsis general guideline is use broad spectrum antibiotic according to the local antibiogram and you have to give us an in, intravenous infusion and should you use a high volume distribution antibiotic or a low volume distribution antibiotic in sepsis low volume of distribution okay um, you should not use very low volume distribution antibiotics you should use the moderately low volume moderate volume of distribution only not very low or not very high okay um, you should use moderate volume of distribution because it should have well, vancomycin is a perfect example it should have some amount of penetrability okay uh, muropenem is another example so it has some amount of penetrability but it should not complete always leave the system in circulation so uh, all as i said before all the major organs are in the system in circulation right so there should be some amount of antibiotic in the system in circulation so you should not use very high volume of distribution drugs antibiotics here and also make sure that you achieve antibiotic concentrations within within one hour of diagnosis. Now, right now it's not possible. I, I hope in the future it will be possible. Loading dose, if required, for example, for drugs which have uh, long half-life, you have to give loading dose. And modify antibiotics with the culture report. So, okay, these are the important points you need to remember for treating sepsis. Lungs, uh, if the infection is in lungs, Optimal bactericidal activity should be there in the lung. Okay, so you should select antibiotic which has high penetration into epithelial lining fluid. Polymyxins are the exact opposite of that. So you cannot use polymyxins to treat lung infection. Okay, uh, if you are using polymyxin, you have to administer cholesterol as an inhalation. Otherwise, the antibiotic concentrations will not be adequate in epithelial lining fluid. Of course, some cases patient may improve because of the general immunity or general conditions of the patient may be good. So patient may improve. Uh, that necessarily does not mean that antibiotic has caused the improvement. Okay. So uh, then excellent penetration. So you have to choose antibiotics which have excellent penetration. These are the preferred antibiotics, fluoroquinolones, macrolides, oxas, linolones, and aminoglycosides. These are the antibiotics which have excellent penetration. You can use for treatment of lung infections. And when possible, administer hydrophilic beta-lactam antibiotics as continuous infusion because hydrophilic antibiotics are like, I mean, antibiotics which are easily dissolvable in water. Other one is lipophilic, okay? So examples are meropenem and comacin. They are highly hydrophilic antibiotics. And these antibiotics, you should try to give us continuous infusion. Why? Because when, if you are giving an antibiotic as a continuous infusion, there is a higher chance for, uh, not higher chance, higher uh, levels of antibiotic in the epithelial lining fluid. So the epithelial lining fluid concentrations will increase. This is not only the case with epithelial lining fluid, even if it's a CSF infection, okay? If you give a hydrophilic antibiotic as a continuous infusion or a long duration infusion, you're, you're actually treating the patient better because more amount of drug will be reaching the CSF. So your dose is same, the frequency of administration is same, only the duration of infusion. Longer, the better. Penetration of antibiotics will improve. Administer cholesterol nebulization if you are using cholesterol. And for CNS infection, better you go for small molecular weight. Because so last sorry to interrupt. And there Sorry. is uh, one question in the chat box regarding lungs, sir. Um, Dr. Manu just asked, is the lung penetration with polymyxin be low or high? Poor, poor. It, it, it does not uh, penetrate lungs uh, well, no. Okay, shall we go ahead? Uh, so yes, just sir. to clarify that, uh, actually in ICU, we, uh, I mean, 
the general understanding is that polymyxins penetration in the lung is better and that's why it's used for all uh, lung and related infection uh, even in id when uh, recommends uh, to uh, consider polymyxin for all uh, respiratory infections as compared to colistin they say colistin is better to reserve it for with uh, genito urinary infection whereas you can give polymyxin so could you explain that sir? yeah so it's not about lung it's about kidney okay it's about the urinary tract infection so if uh, colistin use uh, use it for treating uh, renal uh, infections and for all other whether it's lungs or whether it's uh, brain or wherever it is for all other cases use polymyxin that is the general consensus but penetration of both the antibodies are poor for lung infections the reason why colistin is now reserved only for nephrotoxicity is colistin has more uh, complicated kinetics colistin kinetics are more difficult to predict than polymyxin and uh, so that is the reason and the chance for nephrotoxicity is also high with colistin uh, and it's comparatively less with polymyxin because polymyxin is not eliminated renally so these are the reasons why colistin use has come down because one is more difficult to predict the exposure of colistin kinetics are complicated but it's preferred for kin kidney infection because it is eliminated renally you have to use a good penetrating antibiotic for lung infection polymyxins are not so great in penetrating same polymyxin if you look at the molecular structure of polymyxin b and colistin they are similar okay so penetration is roughly the same only there is no difference sure sir thanks okay now with tdm sorry with uh, bayesian pkpd models colistin and polymyxin there won't be any difference when you use bayesian pkpd models basically this, we are doing a study now with subramani sir and the sicu uh, we have started using uh, i mean uh, i have uh, built a model for colistin and uh, we'll have we'll uh, do a study on colistin in icu patients so with the aid of bayesian pkpd models so it will be uh, completely uh, the uh, the patient will be followed followed up throughout the treatment period and we will see the complete exposure and we don't have to frequently monitor that is the advantage of bayesian pkpd models uh, and we will see so if you use bayesian pkpd models you are seeing the kinetics you are seeing the exposure then you won't find a big difference between polymyxin b and colistin this is this is the understanding okay so shall i move ahead yes sir okay thank you so for cns infection smaller molecules are better because it penetrates the brain csf better so the blood brain barrier better and it should be only again like it should be moderately lipophilic not highly lipophilic highly lipophilic means it crosses the blood brain barrier but again it goes out uh, uh, again it goes out so it, you need to retain the antibody for longer time in uh, csf so again mod it should be only moderately lipophilic uh, for low toxic drugs you know so like uh, muropenem or something you just uh, increase the systemic dose without fear if the uh, drug is not very toxic you increase the dose and uh, in this case best thing is intrathecular antibiotic administration especially for these antibiotics because polymyxins as i said before it is a very large they are very large molecules and it, it's very difficult for them to penetrate the membranes it basically cannot penetrate the membranes okay so in those cases you have to uh, do do the intrathecular antibiotic administration skin and soft tissue infections if the inf a patient has uh, vascular you have to look at whether the patient in these conditions if the patient has skin and soft tissue infection you have to look at the area of infection whether there is any vascular insufficiency there are other whether there are any other vascular diseases etc etc so in these cases you have to use drug which have high volume of distribution so if, for example if you have an option between vanco and linosolid for skin and soft tissue infection and if it is not a very uh, dangerous disease you can go for linosolid because it has a much better volume of distribution than vancomycin then you you look at the bactericidal and bacteriostatic so here in the in this case vancomycin is in a solid 
vancomycin is bactericidal the other one is bacteriostatic if the patient is severely ill then obviously you may have to go for vancomycin but otherwise uh, you can go for linosolid then osteomyelitis in osteomyelitis, there are local antibiotic delivery systems which are available, like polymethylmethylmethylmethylate beads. Beads are available, which are antibiotic coated, loaded beads. So locally, because the bone blood circulation is very poor, uh, if you give local treatments, that will be have that will have a better clinical outcome than systemic treatments. Okay. So uh, otherwise use antibiotic with high volume of distribution. Uh, for gram positive organisms, you can use vancomycin or drugs like uh, better, better ones are linosolid, daptomycin, tigicycline, quinipristin, et cetera. For gram negative organisms, cephalosporins are, uh, generally have a very good penetration into the bone. So there are some evidences supporting GDM. Um, for amikacin, PKPD target you need to look at is Cmax by MIC, right? It's a Cmax by MIC. Cmax should be many times above the MIC. That is eight to 12 times above the MIC. At the same time, the trough should be less than five. There is no uh, range. It should be less than five because if the trough goes beyond five, it causes nephrotoxicity. Okay. Uh, so uh, in this study, um, you can see clinical cure uh, was not very significant and microbiological eradication was very significant. For those patients with initial optimal C-peak by MIC. Proportion of patients with clinical cure significantly improved as the C-max by MIC increased. Okay. Then gendamycin and amicacin, tedium and nephrotoxicity. So if for gendamycin, uh, this is a meta-analysis, okay? For gendamycin, in 615 patients for gendamycin and 159 patients for amikacin. For gendamycin, when the trough was less than, semen is always trough, okay? Is less than two milligram per liter, was linked to a significantly low rate of nephrotoxicity than semen more than two. So for gendamycin, it should be, trough should be less than two. And for amikacin, it should be less than 10. I said initially is five. So this study is suggesting 10, less than 10 itself. More than 10 com when compared to more than 10 and less than 10, there was a significant difference. Now, meropinum, uh, for meropinum, I told you, it's not just that 100% of time, the antibiotic concentration should be above MIC. Not only that, the drop should be that, that is a minimum concentration should be five times above the MIC, okay? and that is a significant predictor of clinical response according to this study. Cefepime and ceftacidime. AUIC, I hope you remember AUIC, area under the inhibitory curve. So the AUC above the MIC. So concentrations above the MIC, that really matters. If it's more than 250 and T more than MIC, more than 100, is significantly associated with better clinical cure. Cefepime and ceftacidime. And what about antifungals? Uh, achievement of therapeutic concentrations are associated with improved clinical outcomes. So here, uh, all these antifungals are studied. Fluconazole, voriconazole, anidula fungin, posaconazole, capsofungin. There's a considerable inter-individual variability uh, and attaining on target serum antifungal level was significantly associated with a favorable clinical outcome. Whereas the administration of an adequate antifungal dose was not. So adequate dosing was not related to clinical outcome, but adequate levels of antifungal were related to associated with clinical outcome. And for voriconazole, there's a meta-analysis uh, report. Patients with therapeutic voriconazole serum concentrations were twice as likely to achieve successful outcomes. So those with who have therapeutic uh, voriconazole compared to subtherapeutic voriconazole. The likelihood of toxicity associated with supratherapeutic voriconazole was fourfold that of therapeutic concentrations. So toxicity also. So not only the uh, efficacy, but toxicity also. 
another one on postaconazole meta analysis patients with postaconazole plasma concentrations over 0.5 mg per liter or otherwise called 500 we report as nanogram per ml so it will be 500 nanogram per ml were twice more likely to achieve successful response compared to those with lower concentrations okay so normally we say uh, it should be around for treatment of uh, fungal infections with postaconazole you should be aiming at 100 nanogram per ml okay uh, that is about more than 3800 and all it, you have to be very careful for postaconazole so summary, there is a high variability of antibiotic concentrations in patients. It is proved. So a population average dose may not achieve adequate blood concentrations in significant proportion of patients. So what is population average dose? These are the suggested dose. For example, vancomycin, one gram PD. That is a population average. For a population, that dose will give uh, adequate exposure. But when it comes to individual, there is a lot of inter-individual variability because of which uh, many of the patients will not achieve adequate concentrations in patients with these antibiotics. Then antibiotic exposure is associated with microbiological cure, acute kidney injury, and to some extent clinical cure because clinical cure also depends on other factors, not only the antifungal anti infective uh, exposures. It also depends on the patient factors, right? Antibiotic target concentration should be achieved early in the treatment period, uh, as mentioned before, within, especially within first 48 hours or at least within first 72 hours, you should achieve the targets. Therapeutic drug monitoring is widely suggested to improve the patient outcomes. And the basin PKPD models make TDM more practical. Now, even though we, uh, we have uh, TDM now, Nobody is using it properly. I mean, even vancomycin, we are getting uh, tough samples because it's only one sample we are getting, but uh, we are not even uh, not very happy with the uh, actual um, TDM of vancomycin because we, we can actually do it much better. Um, so, uh, so how do these basin PKPD models help? It's more practical TDM. Achieve target antibiotic concentrations early in the treatment phase itself. So you don't have to wait for steady state or anything. Okay. So you take a blood sample in the initial phases of treatment. Reduce the frequency of estimation of antibiotic concentrations. You don't have to frequently say like um, you don't have to daily or alternate day see the exposure of vancomycin. Maybe once in a week is enough once in a week uh, exposure to vancomycin is enough to actually do the uh, full profiling, concentration time profile. Predict the entire concentration time profile for the entire treatment durations. So these are the advantage of using basin PKPD models. So that's it, thank you. Uh, I can see the chat box, let me see one minute. Um, Shall I read the question, sir? Uh, oh, from course, Dr. Yeah. K. Prakash, um, glycopeptide has poor lung penetration, which means shouldn't I use Banco or Tico for MRSA pneumonia, and should I prefer linozolid instead? Uh, vancomycin lung penetration improves with, as I said before, with the, in, the duration of infusion. So if you give a longer duration, of course the lung penetration improve, improves. Uh, so uh, if the patient is critically ill, uh, we should normally go for, um, of course, the ID are the actual people to do, uh, decide on that. Um, but uh, of course, the penetration is the kind of the penetration is the concern. If you increase the duration of antibiotic giving, uh, it will improve the clinical outcome. So you don't have to always switch to linosolid uh, if your worry is about um, penetration to lungs. One more question is there, sir. Uh, Meropinum, do we need to give a loading dose of two grams because the half life is just one hour? Um, Meropinum, one gram TID as a maintenance dose is generally not uh, achieving adequate concentrations in most of the patients. Uh, so that is a finding which we actually got. Um, and uh, so two gram as a loading dose instead of loading dose i think it should be given as a maintenance dose 
two gram TID for most of the patients. Most of the patients may require it. And why? I mean, it's a antibiotic which do not have so much of toxicity, and you have to couple it with the uh, TDM. So now when uh, Bayesian PKPD models are available, uh, you'll be able to do it more practically. Now the question is, since the half-life is only one hour, whether giving a two gram as a loading dose and then continuing a one gram TID as a maintenance dose, does it help? Uh, I don't think so, but since you are giving the loading dose in the early phase of treatment, yes, of course, um, you're giving a high dose in the initial phase of treatment and patient may benefit out of it. But loading dose here is not going to improve the uh, steady state concentration of meropenem. You rightly said that, Jayaprakash, thank you. Uh, and just to follow up on that question, uh, meropenem has a time dependent killing, isn't it, sir? Yes. So in that case, does giving meropenem as an infusion rather than bolus doses, um, would that improve uh, outcome, sir? It will improve the outcome. So the best, uh, I mean, actually it's proven that if you give meropenem as a continuous infusion, that will achieve the best clinical outcome. So this will not increase the uh, dose, uh, right? It will, you are not increasing the dose of antibiotic, but just only increasing the concentration. But here you have to make sure that the MIC, the antibiotic concentrations are above the MIC. That is very important. So it should be five times above the MIC. When you give the continuous infusion, uh, you are not looking at trough. You are looking at a steady state concentration. It's continuously high. So that steady state concentration should be five times above MIC. You should make sure that. Yes, sir. Uh, one more question is, sir has asked, do we have a TDM for voriconazole in our yes, lab? It, it is available. Uh, we have... Uh, TDM-wise, we have isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide. Then uh, voriconazole, posoconazole, we have. Then we have vancomycin, miro, cholestin, uh, polymyxin we are developing, and uh, we are also developing amikacin. Okay. Okay, sir. If there are uh, no more questions, um, so we would like to really thank you, sir. It was a very informative class. We have learned a lot of things and it has left us with uh, thoughts to uh, every time we do a drug uh, for more uh, to look up the pharmacokinetic dynamics and uh, look at what we need to look, uh, do accordingly. Thank you very much, sir, for the class. And we look forward to hearing more from you in the future, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Bye.